Hey, y'all. Hey, I'd like to uh, throw a shout out to my friend Kim and Clinton at the Exceptional Conservative Show. Appreciate you, bro. Appreciate everything you ever did. Everything you did. We really appreciate it. Moving forward. Um, <clears throat> again, let me move the camera. We are going to present to you a, um, a video that I think m hits the point of where we are with race relations in America. Uh, I think that a lot of black people have been put on this sort of racism merry-go-round that is not solving the problem, that, ha that actually has no intention, that has no ability, really, to solve the problems of what people call systemic racism. Um, <clears throat> we're going to address the economic side. Now, I know there are voices that say that Addressing the economic side without addressing the other things is a snipe hunt, basically, and uh, will not solve the problem. <clears throat> I've always been a believer, and everybody here at Fight Back Media is a believer of, God bless the child who has his own. If you got your own, you ain't got to worry about what other people think. You, ain't, you don't have to worry about what other people do. Now, I am not the only voice on this, so the very first clip I'm going to play is from um, Dr. Jared Bell, who believes that what we're, what we're going to talk about for the rest of the video is a myth. It's a myth. Yes, myth. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Young Frankenstein. Anyway. What is the MOB? The myth of black buying power claims that A, black people misspend more than a trillion dollars every year. B, that this lack of financial literacy prevents black people from closing the income and wealth gaps and C, inhibits the development of political movements in favor of a sole focus on economics. The new book by Dr. Jarrett Ball, The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power, challenges this myth by showing its origins, how it evolved, and is now maintained. All right, let's get started with our premise. Now that you've seen uh, the other side of this argument, um, and I wanted to present that first um, by Dr. Um, Dr. Jared Bell. Um, it's my summation. Now, if, if you agree or disagree with that, you, you feel welcome to comment. It's my summation that Dr. Bell uh, holds the, um, the colonial, Euro, the European colonial as the root of the problem. And that what we're actually seeing is not an is is not just an economic problem, and can't be solved that way. Again, like I said before, um, unless you know, God bless the child that, that has his own. If you got your own money, then you don't have to put up with anything from anybody else. So, uh, we're going to we're going to. I'm not being dispassionate about this. I want to say I say in the onset, I'm not being dispassionate. I believe that. It is an economic situation that we have going on in America that puts the, the black community at a disadvantage. And I'm also of the mind that the idea uh, of getting put on the, on the rope-a-dope of racism um, is actually antithetical to solving the problem. The problem is, the problem is economics has always been economics. Even if you go back and you try to attach the, um, the colonial label to the problem then it was still economics it, it, it was the setting up of nations for economic reasons it was always been about the money it's always you know it, it became about the power when you've got enough money then it's about power and maintaining that power so you can maintain the money uh, and that's a vicious cycle that goes on and on and on so what we're going to talk about here we're going to use some clips um of people like Dr. Umar and um, Dr. Boyce Watkins um, that offer uh, a, a perspective. Frankly, I'm going to be honest that I agree Today in the area of finance. So most people see the title. You know, we have a one trillion dollar buying power, but in the black community, we don't benefit from it at all. Why is that? Uh, because black people are very good at giving their money away. Uh, we, we, we love, we love, uh, we love supporting our masters, uh, former masters. You know, we, it's a, it's a habit, it's a tradition that we've had for hundreds of years. You know, 
Wow. Um, yeah, that's that's Dr. Boyce Watkins on the left, and um, there is the uh, host of the Advice Show, and I'll put that link in the description box um, on the right hand side. Uh, and it's interesting that Dr. Watkins would say that because uh, he again didn't deny that there is a one trillion dollar buying power in the black community. One trillion dollars. Um, what he did say was that it's a problem of not that you have it, but it's what you do with it. And it's about tradition. It's about habit. It's about convenience. Um, that kind of thing that has been one of those economic stumbling blocks, I think, um, in the black community for a lot of for a lot of years, for as long as I've, I've been alive, anyway, as long as I've noticed. Um, Dr. Watkins says for hundreds of years. So in that, in, you know, in that context, I guess I'll take, you know, I'll take a couple hundred years, but we we enjoy that as opposed uh, to sinking. Uh, our our money and our our support into black owned businesses and black owned communities. I think that that we have to be have to be very very careful about that. I think we have to understand that the idea is that the money has got to stay in the community. It because if you, the money stays in the community, you build a couple of things. You build economic power. You build a shield around your neighborhood, around your community that people can't be bought. If you can buy up all the property and make sure that affordable housing is built, you've solved the affordable housing um, problem. But guess what? You have to be able to buy the property first. And in order to buy the property first, you got to have the money to do so. And in order to have the property in the first place that somebody black needs to sell you, the somebody black, the property who's going to keep the property in the community, keep the property in the family, keep the developers on the outside. It's not about race. It's not just about racism. It's about economics. I'm trying to tell y'all it's about the money and it's always been about the money. And it will always be about the money. The gentrification you see isn't just because they don't want black people live in there. It's because they want the property. They want the land. So many stories about um, families who own property, you know, back in the home place, in the woods or whatever. Um, and, you know, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa die. And the kids don't want to, they don't want to live there. They don't want to go back to the farm. They don't want to go back to, you know, to Podunk, Alabama or Podunk, Mississippi or where the hell am I, Tennessee. They don't want, they, they, they don't want to do that. They like their urban lifestyle, that they're like living in their, in their condo in D.C. They like living in their... You know, in their townhouse in Miami, they, they like the life that they're living in. Although they're living from freaking month to month. Trying to keep up with them payments on that on, on that Beamer. You bought that $25,000 Sub-Zero refrigerator, a freezer that you had to have. Because you saw someone on YouTube with it. And you were busting your ass 80 hours a week. But you don't want to go back to where the hell am I, Tennessee? I got it. Do you, boo? But understand, when you sell that property, when you sell it, and then you spend the money, when you don't invest the money back into your own family, even back into your own family, when you don't set up accounts for your kids to go to college, when you don't set up uh, retirement for you and your wife or, or you and your spouse or whatever, when you just spend the money to pay off bills that you've created with stuff that you couldn't afford anyway that you shouldn't have had in the first place, you are now part of the problem. We are our worst enemy, and I think that's what Dr. Ba Dr. Watkins was saying in the last clip. Listen some more. We, we have not been trained to understand what money really is. Money is actually capital. Capital is something that is supposed to be used to help you make more money. Meaning, for example, if I take my money and I buy uh, a building and some trucks in a factory, uh, I'm not buying it so I can just live in the factory. I'm buying it so I can use the factory to make money, right? Or if I buy, even if I buy a cow, I, I, I buy the cow so I can get the milk and sell the milk. 
Well, uh, that's what money is. Money is supposed to be a form of capital that helps you make more money over the long term. It's not supposed to be a form of consumption. Consumption is when uh, you uh, get the money and you say, okay, now I can make more, even more trips to the mall. Uh, you know, the biggest, the worst examples I can, I can think of, man, are cases of like athletes who've never been trained on financial literacy who will literally earn $100 million over, say, a 10, 12 year period and will just engage in extravagant amounts of spending uh, that, that, just, that just don't make any sense. And what they don't understand is that. Uh, when you have that kind of capital on that level, like somebody gives you a hundred million dollars, you can turn that into a billion in a generation. You can turn that into a billion in a generation, and we see it with athletes, and a lot, of, and, and and we see it with entertainers. And unfortunately, because these have been, Dr. Watkins doesn't mention this, but these have been people in our community that we have for at some point looked up to. Uh, these are the people who got out of the hood. These are the people who got, you know what, you know, got their mama a, a, a house when they grew up in the projects and all that stuff. And we look up to them and we sort of try to emulate what we see. But because we never see how it ends a lot of times. We never see how it ends. We never see the athlete that, you know what, was on top of the world at 22 years old. But at 42 years old, is broke, busted, and destitute. And you wonder, what the hell happened to all that money? Well, well, usually it's very simple. <laughs> they spent it. They spent it. And if we're trying to live in the same way, because that's the example, because we've not learned financial literacy either. I wish to God that I knew these lessons as a 20-year-old. Not that I was making $100 million, because I can't dunk a, ba dunk a basketball I've got a vertical leap about, I don't know, uh, uh, thought. I can jump if I'm thinking I'm jumping, but I'm not actually leaving the floor. Um, but so we look to these, unfortunately, we look to these athletes and we look to these um, entertainers as how we're supposed to handle wealth. The problem is that, again, when you see people later, what you find is that what happened to all the money? They spent it. You know, and and it isn't the and, and it isn't just the young generation. I I, I don't want for, for a second that people think that I'm just talking about the about the kids now. Look back at an entertainer like Sammy Davis Jr., who over the course of his career made hundreds of millions of dollars. His friends had to bury him. His friends had to bury him. Complete lack of financial literacy, taking care of your own money, understanding what money's about. I wish I'd learned that lesson early. Because the best thing you have by lesson, by learning that lesson early is time and interest rate. Time and interest rate. Why do you have money? Money is, like Dr. Watkins says, it's capital. Capital to do what? To earn more money. And the more money... <laughs> What's the joke? Life is like a crap sandwich. The, the more bread you got, less crap you have to eat. <laughs> and that's the truth. Now more of Dr. Watkins. So uh, just reframing how we think about money can be huge in terms of uh, changing the game for us uh, a generation or two from now. Did you hear that? Just reframing how we think about money. I heard just reframing how we think. We're, we are, it, it, it is my contention that we are given things to think about. It is the rabbit hole of racism that we are given by mainstream to think about as to why we are not achieving, why, am I, why I'm not achieving personally, we're given these these things to think about. And we're not, and, and in today's culture, really not given the leeway to think outside that box, which is why Fight Back Media exists, to think outside the box. So if, so if we can reframe how we think about money, if we can, like Dr. Watkins talked about, 
if we can look at money as capital to make more money, how much more benefit can you be? How much more benefit can you be? Think about it for a second. Think about if any of us who are in our late 50s, early 60s had, I don't know, $100,000 of liquid assets that we could aim towards any particular cause where we live. That you had $100,000 that you could aim at the Boys and Girls Club. That you could aim at this, this need or that need. How much more good could we do? Then, I mean, could, could we aim money at, again, at affordable housing? Could we aim money at um, providing tutors for our kids in, in failing schools? Could, could, could we support more camp, you know, more, more political campaigns that focus on the needs of our own community? If we had the, the, the liquid capital, if we had the money to do so, and w because we had learned the lesson 20 years ago about what money was for. M money wasn't for getting that Kango hat. When you could have just got a Bucks visor over at, over, over at the TGNY, right? Didn't need that Kango, right? Or you could just use your hand. <laughs> Reframing how we think about money, I think is extremely important to the discussion. Don't you? Now, let me ask you, it's something that I've said, you know, many times before. Black people are the most vain people I know because we will spend our last on the most expensive stuff and we can't afford it. Why is it that you, we as black people have to have the best car, the best uh, clothes, the best hair, the best shoes? But yeah, when you go in a, a person's house, like say some of these single guys, they got all these nice clothes, but then they're sitting on a, a soapbox inside of their apartment, but they look good. Why is that we have our priorities so screwed up financially? Wow, that is a um, quite a loaded premise and a, um, I don't know, a, kind of an ouchy question, isn't it? Um, I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would say that black people are vain. Um, and I don't know if everybody thinks they have the best. Uh, need to need to have the best. I don't think that's everybody. I think that when you when you have these conversations, you have to generalize because if you don't generalize, you can't talk about anything. Because you you just heard that and you're like, well, that's not me. That's nobody I know. And it may not be. And I and I understand that. I don't. I, I want to make sure that I don't sort of put put it out there that I think that everybody's vain because you know I know that these things. We're talking in generalities because we have to talk in generalities to talk, to talk about anything, y'all. Um, so if that hit you personally, that's not my fault that that hit you personally. Um, because some of us grow up believing deeply in instant gratification and doing things that make you feel good. Like you think about a brother who's got, you know, uh, 10 kids and eight babies, mamas, you know, this is not, this is clearly not a person who has engaged in long-term thinking or critical thinking. What have they been doing? They've been basically doing what feels good. She looks cute. I'm going to go have sex with her. And the condom, I don't like this condom, so I'm going to take it off. Boom, next thing you know, you got a bunch of kids and maybe a bunch of diseases to go with it. Well, mm -hmm. the same thing is true when it comes to money. You got some people that think about money as a quick hit. It's like a drug. It's like, I, I got this money. Now I can go get this outfit that's going to make me feel better about myself. I can get this car that's going to make me feel like I'm somebody. I can go drop this money at the club, which is going to make me feel uh, like, 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 I'm, like I'm a successful, important person. And a lot of that really is built on um, uh, not just the instant gratification component, but also low self-esteem. Black mm -hmm. people, we don't love ourselves. We don't love our lives. When your life is miserable and you feel stressed out all the time and you don't feel good about yourself, well, money can kind of be like a temporary way to, to kind of boost that, that up a little bit, just like smoking a hit of crack. Think about it. People that you know, get high on drugs, a lot of times they do it to escape their problems so spending money having the nicest this and the nicest that might be a way to kind of cover up and mask the fact that you're not happy with your life you're not happy with yourself and uh and then once again just not even understanding the power of that money uh goes a long way in causing that to happen 
again, I think that Dr. Watkins makes a really good point here about people who are who are struggling with who they are um, and their and their self esteem. Now, I'm a, I'm a lot like Cat Williams. Then you know, I don't know what I can do about your self esteem <laughs> because I don't know why you feel bad about you. But I think that a lot of low self esteem is learned behavior. Is you know what? It's what you listen to. It's what you watch. It's what you take in. Pastors will say is what you what you let in through the through the ear gates and the eye gates and the spirit gates of yourself. The stuff that you take in gives you can can if you're not careful give you an opinion about yourself. And not and, and so you don't understand that your circumstances, just like everything else, are subject to change. So we have uh, we have a culture that unfortunately. Um, a lot of people suffer with low self-esteem. And a lot of times it's, it's not because of what you hear. And this is important when we start talking about racism. It's not what you hear from white folks. It's what you hear from people around you, what you hear from your relatives, what you hear from your friends, what you hear from people you listen to in the media, what you hear from people that you listen to in entertainment, what you hear from people from, from people that you listen to and you you pay attention to in sports, and what you listen to and what you see on Instagram and Snapchat and and Facebook and Twitter. You take in a lot of the wrong stuff instead of this stuff that I'm offering you tonight. That stuff you ought to be taking in. Our last piece I'll throw in there too is is just hopelessness. Hopelessness. Um, if you feel that your destiny is to be broke, you know, like you say, hey, I ain't never had nothing. I ain't never gonna have nothing. All I got is this job making twelve dollars an hour. That's all I got. Um, you what what happens is hopelessness causes you uh, to not plan for the future because hopelessness causes you uh, to not plan for the future because I think that that's. Probably the most salient, the most important thing that's been said in this video. That hopelessness causes you not to plan for the future. And I think that what you hear can make you hopeless. What you see can make you hopeless. And a lot of times we're hearing this stuff, interestingly enough, not from white people. It's not white people showing up at your door, your door saying that you can't achieve, saying that you won't achieve, saying this is all your life will ever be. It's people that look like you. It's people in your own family a lot of times. Why are you striving? Why are you, what are you doing all that for? Why do you get to go to, you ain't get, you ain't get to go, go, go to that college? You think I'm going to call you, what? You get a master's degree, I'm going to call you massa? You just going to the white folks' school to get, blah, blah, you know, and you hear that on and on, right? You hear that. And, and a lot of, and a lot of black people have been, been hearing that pretty much all their lives and we hear that from our teachers and we hear that from our parents and we and we hear that from our friends and we hear that from our our contemporaries and then eventually if you hear it enough sadly enough you you start believing it and it crushes your hope so without that hope why would you bother to plan for for anything why would you ever think that your condition is changeable it's 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 not permanent and that is not the fault of somebody else why would you think that you would ever have any control and i think that this has been really the ultimate way to keep people away from this you know these this thought pattern this way of changing your thoughts that you can actually have control of your own life and that you can control your circumstances and this is the best way to do it in the next clip, um, Dr. Umar talks about reparations, and because there's, there's been a lot of talk about reparations, it's interesting though. If you think about it, the closer we get to the election, less talk we're hearing from the left about reparations. But that's another video. He talks about reparations. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with everything that Dr. Umar says about reparations, but I do agree on this point. Check this out. Do you feel that we should be concerned? with what's owed to us, as far as reparations mm -hmm. and things that were stolen? Excellent question. I believe we should be concerned 
with things that are owed to us as it relates to reparations, things that were stolen, unpaid wages from slavery. However, the question becomes, what do you prioritize? Do you prioritize your external reparations or do you prioritize your internal reparations? See, for me, the internal always precedes the external and that the external should not come until the internal has taken place or the external will benefit the oppressor more than it benefits you. In other words, I think there's white people who are praying for black people to get reparations. I'm going to say it again. I think there's white people who are praying for black people to get reparations. Why? Because we have no internal infrastructure. We have no economic cyclical network. If we got a trillion dollars today for slavery, white folks would be a trillion dollar richer tomorrow. Because Not that I walk 100% in lock, in lock think with Dr. Umar, but what he, what he said, says in this clip is an excellent point. It's an excellent point. The point is simply that if we don't create an economic infrastructure, none of that stuff's going to matter. It's not going to matter. And if you do, and, and if you create that economic infra infrastructure, then you can take the money that we are already that we already have that we're already using, and become a stronger, more vibrant community than ever. It's my own personal thought. And I won't play another clip. Uh, it's my own personal thought that it is better to first have your own, second, be in control of your own, and then be able, be able to pass that down. It is the continuous starting over generation after generation after generation that adds to the hopelessness that Dr. Wat Watkins was talking about. It's I gotta start from zero. I gotta start from that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have anything. My mama didn't have anything. My dad didn't have anything. My grandpa didn't have anything. My grandma didn't have anything. You know what, the people before them, they didn't have anything. So if someone shows up, now these are my thoughts, and says the reason you don't have anything is because they have it all. The reason your grandma didn't have nothing because these people over here have it all. And you might buy into that. Because it's easier. The hard truth, it's hard for a reason. The hard truth is that what we're experiencing now, we can fix. And Dr. Watkins uh, alluded to it. It may take a couple of generations. It's not a quick fix. It's not instant gratification. Dr. Umar says the instant gratification could be the worst thing that ever happened. So how much do you care about this? How much do you care about your community? What are you willing to do? How long are you willing to stand? Don't say we've been standing because I'm not talking about, I'm not, I ain't talking about we, I'm talking about you. How long are you willing to stand? How much are you willing to be inconvenienced? How long will you wait? How hard will you work? How much will you invest? How much will you teach yourself? My name is Willie Lawson. This is Fight Back 2020. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you. Thank you to Phil at the Advice Show. Uh, thank you for Dr. Uh, for his interview with um, Dr. Boyce Watkins and the clip with Dr. Umar. Thank you ever so much. Uh, until we see you again, go out there and learn something, love somebody, and for goodness sakes, y'all take care of yourself. We'll see you when we see you. Bye-bye now.